time worshiping the Lord this evening, isn't it? So good to be in the house of the Lord. It's great to worship him and just feel his presence as we sing together. We've been in a series on, in Exodus, and I want to welcome you to church. If you're new, you can jump in with us. Uh, and if you've missed some of these messages, I encourage you to get on the podcast, get on YouTube, go back and watch them and catch up. Because obviously as you read through, it all kind of builds on itself. And you wouldn't read a novel and just skip whole chapters, would you? You would, you would pick up where you left off. So I want to encourage you to do that. The message I'm going to preach tonight is very different than probably any sermon you've ever heard. And I want to warn you, if you came to church as a guest tonight, it will feel probably different than what you expected. You will figure out really quick whether you love this church or hate this church. You'll probably know by the end of the night. And it's better you just figure it out sooner than later because we are running out of space. So, you know. <laughs> so the message tonight is titled, Jesus is not a pacifist. Some sermons I will do are a little bit more preachy and encouraging, and then some sermons are a little bit more teaching, and this is a more of a teachy sermon, so you kind of have to pay attention because I'm going to move quick and cover a lot. In Exodus chapter 2, it says this, One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Reuel, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian, Moses, rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Reuel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Okay, so we're going to talk about this passage tonight. You see a pattern of Moses coming to the rescue of people in their time of need. You see him there picking up with these daughters of Reuel. They're watering their father's flocks and these thug shepherds come along and, and rush them off the scene. You know, they kind of like strong arm them uh, off. But Moses stands up. And he, he didn't just like shoo those guys away, like, get out of here, you guys, shoo. You know, he's probably coming in with roundhouse kicks, like shepherd staff, whack, and uh, drives them off, waters the girls' flocks for them. Come on, single ladies, how good does that sound? <laughs> they go home and tell their dad, and they're like, where is this guy? This guy sounds like husband material, you know? And so they like, get him over here. He gives him one of his daughters. Like, that's the kind of guy I want to marry my daughter. And, you know, I read this passage where Moses kills an Egyptian, and it really bothers me that people unfairly criticize Moses and slander him as a murderer. I've read commentaries that talk about this passage and say that Moses took matters into his own hands and got ahead of God's timing when he killed the Egyptian, or maybe that he lost his temper the only thing is, that's not what the actual Bible says. And so we've got to be very careful when we come to the Bible with our own preconceived notions and political ideologies and read those in to the Bible, because that can lead you astray. It can lead you away from the meaning of Scripture that God intended you to actually get from it. So when, you come, when it comes to exposition of Scripture or explaining Scripture, there are two ways to do it, a good way and a bad way. The first is called exegesis. This is a word you can drop in a sentence this week to impress your friends. <laughs> exegesis is when you try to listen to the text and let the meaning come from the text in its original historical context. That's the good way to exposit scripture. Exegesis. Eisegesis, that's the bad one. Boo, eisegesis. 
That's when you bring your own agenda and meaning to the text, and you're not concerned with the original historical context of the biblical passage, okay? So we don't want to do that. We want to do good exegesis. And here's the problem that we have today is all kinds of people with their own political motives. You got pacifists, hippies, progressives, people who hate guns and the military and the police. They hate the death penalty. They will use scripture out of context to make their own point, to push their own agenda, and they'll wrap it in a Christian veneer falsely. When you actually read the Bible, you see that Moses was not a murderer. Moses was a deliverer. And I want to explain that tonight so you walk away from here thinking properly about our guy, Moses. He wasn't a perfect man, but he wasn't a murderer. And sometimes people say that. They'll be like, God can use anyone. They used, he used David as an adulterer. He used Moses a murderer. Moses wasn't a murderer, though. That's not what the Bible says. Moses fought against evil, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, Moses chose to be among God's people. We talked about that last week, that by faith, he left the palace and associated himself with the people of God. And Moses did not think like a slave. He was raised as royalty. So in Exodus 2, he happens along uh, as this Egyptian taskmaster is beating a slave. And he intervenes. And so you have to think, like, well, what was he supposed to, what else was he supposed to do? You know, it's none of my business. Mind your own business, Moses. No, because our God is a God of justice, and his people are people of justice. And he didn't put Moses there or you here to just turn a blind eye in the face of injustice and think like a slave. See, faced with injustice, a slave thinks, I've just got to take it. But a prince says, I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it. Moses was born a slave, but he was made a prince, the same as you through faith in Jesus. You were made royalty through faith in Jesus. Moses stood up for his brother in his hour of need, and we want to make sure that we think properly about that so that we'll act in the way God wants. We want to make sure we're discipled by Scripture and not the culture around us. So we don't want to unfairly criticize God's servant, Moses. Let's think about this. In America, our laws justify the use of deadly force when there is an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Nobody ever wants to be in that situation where they have to use deadly force for self-defense, but when a reasonable person in the same situation would believe that another person has the present ability, opportunity, and apparent intent to immediately cause death or serious bodily injury to another, the law allows you to use deadly force to stop that threat. Okay, so you think about that. Go back and look at scripture again. In verse 11, it said, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Okay, so this wasn't like necessarily just an Egyptian smacking a Hebrew or maybe, you know, kind of kicking a Hebrew. You want to understand really what it's saying. Otherwise, you might think he's overreacting by killing that Egyptian. In Hebrew, the word beating comes from the Hebrew word nakah, and the King James translates that 348 times as smite. That means to strike with a heavy blow, as slay 92 times, as kill 20 times, as beat just nine times. So it could be accurate to say the Egyptian was beating the Hebrew, but commentaries point out it could also be accurate to say the Egyptian was killing the Hebrew or beating him to death. We don't know 100% because we don't get all the details but Moses intervened because there was an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. And what was happening was an injustice in the eyes of God. In Exodus 2.12, it says, Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Okay, so I think this is the verse that we read. And a lot of times we let this verse influence us into thinking that Moses did something wrong, that he murdered the guy. Because we kind of read ourselves into the scene and we assume some things based on this verse that might not be correct. Okay, so we picture Moses, you know, he knows I'm going to do a very bad thing. And he's like looking around. Is anyone, is anyone watching? And he kills the guy and then he hides him in the sand. That kind of just, it seems shady in some ways. But that's not necessarily what this is describing here. When it says that he's looking this way and that and seeing no one, that phrase, seeing no one, it's literally seeing no man 
the word man is used in Hebrew, uh, it's not necessarily that he was just checking to make sure the coast was clear, although that could be what it's telling us. It's also very possible, Jewish commentaries point out, that Moses was looking around like hoping someone else would intervene. Looking this way and that and seeing no man. The word man is ish in Hebrew. And, and this phrase man, you know, it's used to describe a man. But also it's used to just say, you know, be a man. They'll say ish and it means be a man. So Moses looking around like, is anyone going to do anything? Seeing no man, he intervened. He killed the Egyptian. He stepped in because no one else was there to do it. it makes me think about in 2013, there was a movie called 12 Years a Slave and it won an Oscar for Best Picture. It's a hard movie to watch. There's a scene where a master is whipping a slave woman to the brink of death. And you can only imagine if you were, in a, if you were there in a moment like that, how much you would hope for some man to step in and stop it. For, for some man to step in and do something. Well, there's a phrase in the Jewish Talmud that says this, in a place where there is no man, be a man. The world needs more men to step in and be a man, especially in places where there are no men. The world needs men to step in and be a mentor to young kids who have no father. The world needs men to step in and protect women who are being abused by bad men. The world needs men to step in and lead in churches and stop sitting by passive, like pacifists, like not doing, passively, that's the word I was meaning for, passively not doing anything. The world needs men to step in and lead in business and in politics and in society because that's what it takes. And so I would propose that Moses hid the body Not because he knew he did something wrong or was ashamed of his sin, because the Bible never says he sinned, but because he did something illegal. That's why he hid the body. He did something illegal according to the law of Egypt. But just because he broke the law of Egypt doesn't mean he committed a sin in the eyes of God. And you got to keep that in mind, because God was very quick to call out Cain for killing his brother Abel. God called out David for murdering Uriah, but God never says Moses murdered. If you were rescuing a slave from the South during you know, the Civil War times or before the Civil War, that would have also been illegal, and you would have had to sneak that slave out of slave territory. But it wasn't wrong just because you did it in secret. Or during World War II, Corrie Ten Boom, you imagine her you know, hiding Jews from the Nazis. I'm sure before she snuck Jews into her house, she looked both ways to make sure the coast was clear. And then she hid them. And it was illegal according to the law of the Nazis, but it wasn't wrong in God's eyes. So let's not mislabel Moses a murderer when God sent him as a deliverer. And and then I want to kind of further tease this out. The next day Moses sees two Hebrew men fighting and he tries to stop that. He asks the one in the wrong, it says in verse 13, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Come on, like, what's wrong with you, bro? Like, why are you hitting each other? Why are you fighting? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Have you ever had a situation like that where you confront someone who's doing something wrong and they try to point the finger back at you to deflect attention from what they're doing that's wrong? What about you? Oh, yeah, I remember one time you. And and so that's what's happening here. And, And if you don't think about that with discernment, you know, we're in a world today with all kinds of cancel culture and People will bring up each other's past and bring up, you know, what, what someone tweeted seven years ago and try to get them fired from their job. And in some ways that kind of reminds me of this, where Moses is pointing out a legitimate wrong. Why are you guys fighting? You're supposed to be brothers. And the guy's all like, what about you? Are you going to kill us like that Egyptian yesterday? Boom, gotcha. You've been like just burned, right? And I, I don't know if that's what he thought was happening there, but this was character assassination. Because what Moses did wasn't wrong. But I think this is a good time to be reminded of this. We can be easily sucked into slander and false accusations. Because as humans, we tend to be drawn to gossip like flies are to manure. And we hear about someone else's wrongdoing or failures, and we tend to be like, oh, really? Tell me more. And sometimes, because that makes us feel better about ourselves. Sometimes there are people who even delight in the failures of others. 
And I think as Christians in this world that we live in where people are getting called out left and right, we got to be careful to consider the source. God knew that you can't just trust an accusation at face value when you hear it. God knew that. That's why in Deuteronomy 19, the Lord made it so that with his people, you could not convict someone of a crime unless there was more than one witness. Because he knew that you can't trust people not to abuse the system and make false accusations. We live in a world today, though, that says, hey, anytime someone makes any accusation, you have to believe them. That's the right thing to do. Believe them. Now, for, here's an example. In Genesis 34, it records a rape that takes place. So the Bible does, does acknowledge that. This, this woman was raped. And then in Genesis 39, on the other hand, you see an example where Joseph is falsely accused of rape by Potiphar's wife because he wouldn't sleep with her. And so you can't just believe every accusation you hear. Why? Because people lie. People do lie, don't they? Anybody here never told a lie? Okay, yeah, you're a liar. <laughs> just kidding. That's why in the, first, in the New Testament, you see this principle repeated. 1 Timothy 5.19 says, Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. Why? Because God knows there are people that want to take down his leaders who will make false accusations. And that the shepherd is always the bad guy when the wolf is telling the story. So consider the source. So when Moses confronts these guys and it says, you know, the one in the wrong... He asked him, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? That phrase, the one in the wrong, in Hebrew, it's translated, it's literally, it means wicked. The wicked guy. The ungodly guy. That's the one Moses confronted who turned the finger back at Moses. So you don't want to read that wicked man's accusation against Moses and let that influence the way we think about what Moses did. But some people get confused by this. I think at this point, maybe you're wondering, okay, well, how does this apply to us? Because you're saying Moses wasn't a murderer. Okay, fine, I get that. But then we're Christians, and, you know, the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill, right, in the old King James. So does that mean it's wrong to kill or not? Well, I think you have to understand the difference between murder and killing. Let's talk about that. There's been a lot of confusion on this subject due to, it goes back about 400 years, a poor translation in the King James Version of the Bible. We all know that scripture was originally written in Hebrew and in Greek, a little bit of Aramaic, and it's been translated into other languages like Latin, German, English. And those translations over time, as more manuscripts have been found by archeologists, have gotten accurate and more accurate in some cases to the point where we're like 99.7% accurate guaranteed, very little uh, discrepancy. And when there is a discrepancy, it'll be like a, a comma or a word that has no effect on the meaning. But the King James Version was translated about 400-ish years ago. And since then, a lot more manuscripts have been found. A lot of refinement has happened. And so some of our modern translations are actually a lot more accurate and also a lot easier to understand. Amen? I talk to people all the time grew up reading the King James Version, and they're like, yeah, I just I don't, I don't really get a lot out of it. I'm like, that's because it was written in English that was used four or 500 years ago. That's why the Mormons only let their people read the King James Version of the Bible. Because if they could read it in a version they understood, they would realize that everything they're taught contradicts it. I'm getting off on a rant. So in the King James Version, Exodus 20, 13, the sixth commandment says this, thou shall not kill. So you can understand why people read this and they were confused. Like, man, does that mean it's, it's immoral to go to war? I should be a conscientious objector? Or, this has caused a lot of confusion for soldiers, police officers, or anyone who's had to kill in self-defense. And they, they feel like they must be on bad terms with God because they've done something wrong. And Many of these defenders, soldiers, they feel alienated from Christianity, not because they don't want Jesus, but because they don't know how to reconcile Scripture, as it appears here, with their role as a warrior or a protector or a peacekeeper. So that's why you have to understand, you know, kind of back to the original meaning, thou shalt not kill. The word kill here in the King James Version is the Hebrew word rasha, and it's translated this way. 16 times as slayer, 
14 times with murderer, five times as kill, three times as murder. So you can kind of see that more often than not, it's used to describe murder. And modern translations make it clear that a more accurate translation of this commandment is thou shall not murder. Thou shall not murder. And the word here, murder, same word, this is not the word used to describe Moses killing that Egyptian. Thou shall not murder. This is the word used in the New King James, the ESV, the NLT, the NIV, or like the Amplified Version adds some commentary. You shall not commit murder that is unjustified, deliberate homicide. Also, it communicates and includes don't kill through recklessness. You should not kill through recklessness because human life is precious. So the sixth commandment, are we tracking this? It does not say thou shall not kill. It says thou shall not murder. And understanding that, we know that God does not forbid killing in self-defense or in a just war or for the death penalty. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. A lot of people, though, they get kind of wrapped up and they'll, they'll, they'll think, well, yeah, but what about like all the stuff Jesus said in the New Testament? And, and I've heard all these things that Jesus said. And there are those who will take Jesus's words out of context and use them to argue Christians can't condone any use of force. So let's think about that. Matthew 5, Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So man, love your enemies. That means you can't attack your enemies. You can't go to war with your enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. Now you got to understand the context of this. The Old Testament said, love your neighbor. Jesus says, I'm telling you, love your enemies. But there's a big difference between loving your enemies and letting your enemies kill you. You can love someone without letting them kill you. Right? Now, Jesus let his enemies kill him. But that was part of God's will and the reason Jesus came in the first place to die for our sins. Jesus laid down his life and died so that you could stand up and live. And he calls us to die to ourself. He calls us to die to our own flesh. But that doesn't mean you have to let other people destroy your flesh. Matthew 5.39, Jesus says, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Does that mean it's wrong to defend yourself if someone's trying to beat you up? Does that mean a wife should let her abusive husband slap her around? No, obviously not. You need the context. Jesus was refuting the thinking of that day. In Middle Eastern culture, it's a lot like Eastern Asian culture. It was an honor-based culture. So if someone insulted you and you lost face, you were honor-bound to settle the score and get even to restore your honor. So you had all these like revenge killings that would happen and, and it was just crazy. And Jesus is teaching, you don't have to get even just because someone insults you. You don't have to settle the score because someone wronged you. You know, just because someone flipped you off in traffic doesn't mean you have to go road rage on them. (laughs) That's not the way it's supposed to work. Let God come to your defense. But that does not forbid you from stopping someone from actually physically attacking you. That, that is not what Jesus was trying to tell you. Just sit, sit there and take it. Psh, 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 psh. No. Or how about this? Matthew 26. Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. This is Jesus talking to Peter and you might read that and say, well, see right there, Jesus said, put your sword away. You shouldn't use a weapon in self-defense. That's not what this is saying. You have to read the whole Bible to understand the message of the Bible. Imagine that. You got to read the whole Bible. So if you back up 10 chapters before that, you see that Peter had been resisting God's plan. Jesus told his disciples, here's what's going to happen, guys. Here's the game plan. I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to be killed. And then three days later, I'm going to rise again. He told them, this is what's going to happen. And then here's what Peter did. Peter took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. Can you imagine trying to rebuke Jesus? (laughs) Talk about acting a fool. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. It's a bad day when Jesus calls you Satan. 
It's like, you just got an F that day. Okay, but there's grace. Try again. So when, when Jesus told Peter, put your sword away in the garden, he was rebuking him like, Peter, you're still trying to interfere with God's plan in your own human power. And yet we can still take a principle away from that moment in the garden. He said, if you li- live by the sword, you die by the sword. And there is a principle there you see repeated in scripture that you reap what you sow. If you're quick to rush into violence, you're likely to find violence. If you take from others, you're likely to have it taken from you. If you try to act outside of God's will like Peter was, you're going to be experiencing a reality outside of God's blessing. Okay, then to understand how God feels about killing, you have to understand God. And I want to make this very clear. The Jesus of the Gospels is the God of the Bible. Let me say that again. The Jesus of the Gospels is the God of the Bible. They are three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they are one. And Jesus has existed eternally from before time began. He was not a created being. He manifested as a physical being when he came to this earth, but he has always existed. And whenever the Bible talks about God said this, it's the same as if Jesus said that. Because the Jesus of the Gospels is the God of the Bible. Are you tracking that? If you are, say amen. amen. Some of you are like, I think so. Here's what, <laughs> let me explain. John 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. So if you ever hear someone say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Yes, he did right there. You know how, that I, I know he claimed to be God. In case there was any confusion, in the Jewish law, it was punishable by stoning to commit blasphemy. And so the Pharisees picked up stones to stone Jesus right there because they knew what he was saying. He was claiming to be God. In Hebrews 13, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the Jesus of today is the same as the Jesus of tomorrow, is the same as the Jesus of the day of Moses. He's the same. And then we see in Malachi, God says, I, the Lord, do not change. We just sang this song, you're the same God. You're the same God. That's going to be a theme of this sermon. Numbers 23 says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He's not a human, so he does not change his mind. So everything God says about killing and murder in his word helps to inform our understanding of how God feels about killing versus murder or justified killing versus unjustified murder. And so follow me on this. The circumstances of the world around us might change. That means the way we apply scripture to our life might change. But God's nature does not change. So his standards of right and wrong are unchanging because they're part of his nature. He is a God of justice. And justice is in his nature. Okay, so I'm going to bring this to a practical place and talk about some of the issues facing you in society. First, let's talk about the death penalty. God created the death penalty because God values life. This is relevant, especially because recently, as we've talked about abortion, people will point fingers and say, oh, you Christians, so contradictory. You say you're pro-life, but then are you for the death penalty? Boom, gotcha, burn. (laughs) It's not contradictory. It's moral consistency. In Genesis 9, we see God creating the death penalty. Here's what he says. And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. Now be fruitful and multiply and repopulate the earth. Because I want to point a couple things out. If you're familiar with scripture, you'll get more of this maybe. But first, God said this before the nation of Israel was even created. So this wasn't just like a law for the people of Israel. This was reflective of God's heart towards the value of life and the consequences of bloodshed. Also, God said this before the law of Moses was given. So again, happened before even the law of Moses came to be. Also, God, when he talks about the value of life and the consequences, he refers back to creation. For a man was made in God's image. 
And anytime you read something in scripture where they refer back to creation, that's usually a clue. That's what's being discussed there is a universal enduring principle. Okay? When you refer back to creation, it's kind of like, like Jesus did this when he was talking about marriage and sexuality. And he said this, have you not read that from the beginning God created them male and female? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Have you not read that from the beginning, referring back to creation? Don't you guys remember the original design? That's a clue right there for you as Bible scholars. By the way, Jesus right there. He just ruled out transgenderism, homosexuality, and gender theory. Some people will try to say, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. He didn't have to. You know why? He didn't have to go through and list all the depraved ways that man might sin sexually. Because what he actually did was he laid out and made it very clear God's plan for sexuality. Have you not read that from the beginning God made them male and female? Not male and or female on a sliding spectrum. And he said, a man will leave his father and mother, not his father and father, or his mother and mother, or his father and mother and some other crazy combination, and will be united to his wife. Right? Jesus made it very clear, God's design. So he doesn't need to go through and say, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. An argument from silence is not a valid argument. So in Genesis 9, God says, human life is precious because all men are made in God's image. All mankind, that includes the ladies, is made in God's image. And life is so precious to God that if you take a human life unjustly, you forfeit your own right to life. That's a fitting penalty in God's eyes. And it's a deterrent to moral depravity. Okay, there's a movie that came out a little while ago called The Purge. This is not me endorsing the movie. It's like a dark, weird movie, but I think the plot is interesting. In the movie called The Purge, some of you already know what it's about. I'm not judging you tonight. Okay. In the movie, the plot is for one day... It's legal to murder. And so all these people, what do they do? They go buck wild murdering each other. And I think it's funny because it's maybe one of the most realistic movies that's ever been made. (laughs) We live in a world where people walk around like, I'm just a good person. I just know I am because I rescue puppies from shelters. And I know I do wrong, but I think I do more more good than, than bad. It's like... Yo, if you could get away with it, you would do a lot of bad. If you could get away with it, you'd be out murdering in the streets. I mean, a lot of us, we're Christians, and we'd be thinking about it. No, no, I'm not supposed to do that. But one of the reasons why God made such a serious punishment for murder is because he knows that that deters us from doing wrong. You know, if if you're afraid of the consequences, you're less likely to do wrong. In Romans 13, 4, it says, For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They're God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Okay, so we do know that obviously sometimes government gets it wrong or they do wrong. But in general, God establishes authority and governing authorities for the good of mankind, despite the flaws, because... The fear of consequences and the rule of law. Government carries the sword. They are agents of God's wrath to bring punishment to evildoers. And that restrains people from doing wrong. And and this passage is basically saying, you know, if, if you don't do wrong, you generally have a lot less to fear from the government. And so Christians should support the death penalty because God does. We want it to be applied properly. We want people to be convicted properly and justly. And we don't see anyone get unjustly convicted. But if you value human life, then you should be pro-life when it comes to innocent babies and pro-death when it comes to convicted murderers. Okay, I'm moving on with this very politically incorrect sermon. Here's the next thing. God allows killing for self-defense because God values life. I know we got a lot of guys in the room, you got gun owners, and, you know, you're waiting for this one. Here it comes. Okay, so 
It says this in Exodus 22. If a thief is caught in the act of breaking into a house and is struck and killed in the process, the person who killed the thief is not guilty of murder. But if it happens in daylight, the one who killed the thief is guilty of murder. Okay, so I'm going to explain that second part there. But this is a very similar law to the law that we have in Arizona. And in Florida and Texas, it's called the Castle Doctrine. It exists in other free states as well. And <laughs> this basically says... <laughs> ah, I love this church. I love it. Basically says, you know, if someone breaks into your house, you have the right to use deadly force. So you can just kind of imagine, right? If someone breaks into your house, boom, middle of the night, goes bump. The wife leans over and is like, honey, I heard something. Go check it out. And he's like, you check it out. And she's like, no, Pastor Ryan said, be a man. Be a man. So he gets up and he goes down the hallway with his golf club or his shotgun or whatever. You know, and, he, and if he swings and he hits the guy and the guy dies, the law says that guy is not guilty of murder. And, and it might be sad that somebody died, but you know what God's attitude is? Dude shouldn't have been breaking into houses. If you don't want to get killed, don't break into houses. But in the second half of this verse, but if it happens in the daylight, the one who killed the thief is guilty of murder. What does that mean? So what this is, not, this is talking about is you go and find the guy who stole your DVD player the next day and you shank him. God says, no, 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 no. That's not cool. That's not cool. That's not justice. That's vengeance. Okay, so you see the same God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. Self-defense is justified because God values human life. This is why Moses was justified in killing the Egyptian, because God values the life of that Hebrew who is being unjustly beaten, maybe beaten to death. And this passage in Exodus 22 is consistent with what you read in the New Testament, because God is the same. He does not change. In Romans 12, 19, it says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So right here, that doesn't say you can't defend yourself from someone who's attacking you, but defending yourself is different than avenging yourself. Avenging yourself is getting even, settling the score, going after someone else when you don't have to. God will settle the score. But what about Jesus, Pastor Ryan? Jesus was so nice and he was so kind and he was always caring for people and feeding people. What would Jesus say? What would Jesus say about this? Well, I'll show you. Luke 22, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he asked them, when I sent you out to preach the good news and you did not have money, a traveler's bag, or an extra pair of sandals, did you need anything? No, they replied. But now, Jesus said, take your money and a traveler's bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. For the time has come for this prophecy about me to be fulfilled. He was counted among the rebels. That's the prophecy. Yes, everything written about me by the prophets will come true. Look, Lord, they replied, we have two swords among us. That's enough, he said. Okay, this is a passage that people don't talk about. They don't talk about this. Did you know Jesus told these guys to get a sword? Did you, did you, ever, you ever memorize that Bible verse as a kid? No. Okay, so what, what's happening here? Okay, the first time... Jesus sent out his disciples to preach the good news. He specifically told them, don't take anything with you. No money, no supplies. Why? It's because he wanted to build their faith. Do you remember how they came back from that journey full of faith? They were like, Jesus, you're not going to believe it. We did miracles in your name. And even demons obeyed us when we cast them out. And Jesus said, don't rejoice because demons obey you. Rejoice because your name is written in the book of life. Right? Remember that? They, it was building their faith. It was like Jesus was sending them out with training wheels. Because these were the guys he was going to use to build his church. So he needed to encourage them that God can provide for your needs. God can take care of you. Just go and God's going to make a way. But now, in that passage, but now, that was the first time, but now, take a traveler's bag, 
bring money and get yourself a sword. Well, what's going on there? Jesus is basically saying, the first time I sent you out to build your faith, I sent you out by my power. This time, going forward, I'm going to send you out by my power and your good planning. So, So go ahead, bring yourself supplies and get you a sword. Why? Because they're going to face danger. It's, the prophecy about me is going to be fulfilled. He's counted among the rebels. You're going to be considered criminals because of me. You're going to face danger because of me. And he wanted them to be able to defend themselves and stay alive long enough to tell people about him. So they're there like, well, we got two swords. Like in modern times, it's like, we got a Glock and an AR-15. <laughs> and Jesus is like, that's enough. But it's actually interesting. He says, that's enough. And that tells you he didn't want them to raise an army and conquer in his name. He just wanted them to take reasonable precautions to defend themselves as they preached his name. You see that? So today we are unfortunately in a situation where we see in the news reports of mass shootings or something like that. You know, it's terrible. Of course, the media just plasters it across our face. And people are so shocked when they see this, because it is terrible. And you just wonder, like, how could this even happen? And, and then you have people around us in society, they want someone to blame. They want something to blame. And so they usually turn their attention on the guns. And they'll be like, guns did this. Guns killed those people. But I would propose to you that guns are just tools. Guns are tools like a hammer or a chainsaw. A tool is not it does not have an intrinsic moral value. You can use the same tool for good or for evil. You can use a hammer to beat someone to death or to build your kid a birdhouse. It's just a tool. What matters is how you use it. So you got a lot of people in society that ra- rather than looking in the mirror and facing the depravity of man and the fact that we just raised a fatherless generation because of the sexual depravity of our nation, They just want to blame an inanimate object. It's true. Guns don't kill people. People kill people with weapons. And I would actually say guns save people. In 2013, President Obama commissioned a report from the CDC and different federal agencies. And they estimated that as many as 3 million violent crimes are prevented each year by law-abiding citizens with guns. That's 8,200 per day. And in many of those cases, no shots were even fired, no blood was shed. It's just the fact that there was a gun present that prevented the crime. 66% of economists and criminologists state that gun-free zones are more likely to attract criminals than they are to deter them. It's just common sense. And then I like this. 60% of convicted felons admit that they avoided committing crimes when they knew the victim was armed. And 40% of convicted felons admitted they avoided committing crimes when they thought the victim might be armed. So as a Christian, I love guns. And it's not because of political party affiliation or because I'm an Arizonan. It's because I love justice. I love God and God loves justice. And a tool like a gun gives a 130-pound woman the potential opportunity to fight off a would-be raping murderist who outweighs her by 100 pounds. So I like that. I know, this is a strange sermon, right? It's like you haven't heard a sermon like this. Here's the last point. God permits killing in just war because God values life. I was watching this interview with a guy from SEAL Team 6 named Rob O'Neill, and this is the guy who shot Osama bin Laden three times in the face. And... (laughs) He's talking about war and fighting and killing terrorists. And at one point in the interview, he says kind of bashfully, like, I'm just good at it. He's like, we're we're just good at it, to be honest. Like, and the thing is, they don't know how to reconcile that. They, They kind of feel embarrassed to say it, but it's true. They're good at it. And a lot of Christians would hear that and they would cringe like, oh, that's terrible. It's terrible to brag about being good at killing at war, right? That's terrible. What a terrible thing to say. That's foolish thinking. That'd be, a, that'd be a foolish judgment to make 
And only people who've lived their whole lives in safety without experiencing victimization or oppression would think something like that. Because there are a lot of people in the world who've experienced real victimization, real oppression. Like I watched a few years ago as ISIS rolled through northern Iraq, very area where I was deployed to, and they were beheading Christians from Kurdistan. And they were raping their wives and kidnapping their children and taking them into sex slavery. There are evil people in the world like that who would gladly do the same thing to you and your family. So as God-fearing, Jesus-loving people, we should thank the Lord that he raises up. He raises up scary, violent, good men who are good at war to destroy scary, violent, evil men. This isn't just based on my opinions. This is biblical. Psalm 144, David said this, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He's my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. I love that. He's like saying the same thing. I'm good at fighting. I'm good at war. And God's the one who made me good at what I do. So there, there might be people in the room today, maybe you got people here, you're, you're good at shooting, you're good at war, you're good at fighting, you're a boxer, you're an MMA guy, you're a military police, right? And you're capable of deadly violence. That is not something to be ashamed of. That's a gift that God gave you to use for good, to fight against evil and protect the innocent. And we thank God for that. But then with that being said, we keep in mind, Romans 12, 18 says this, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So it's good to have a particular set of skills. <laughs> but if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, don't go looking for trouble. Don't go looking for violent situations. Live at peace with everyone whenever you can. We want peace, but unfortunately, you know, you know why it's phrased that way? Because it's not always possible. Sometimes you could be like, I don't want any trouble, but there are bad people who are intent on doing bad things. And in those situations, God condones the use of even deadly force. Again, I'm, I'm coming to an end here. I know some people, they could struggle with this, but Jesus was so compassionate and loving. He healed people. Jesus wouldn't want us to kill people. Well, it's good to recognize that Jesus, remember, he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He came the first time to be the lamb who was slain, but he's coming back the second time as the lion of Judah. He's the same. He's the same person today as he was 2,000 years ago, as he will be when he returns. And the Bible talks about when Jesus returns in the future, prophesies about his return. When we get an image of what it's going to look like in Revelation 19. And it's pretty violent. It says this, Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. Who is that? It's Jesus. Jesus is the rider. For he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gather to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. Their entire army was killed by that sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. And the vultures all gorge themselves on the dead bodies. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Jesus was so compassionate when he walked the earth, right? But when he comes back again, you want to be on his side. Because you won't like him when he's angry. <laughs> right? The first time he came to feed the hungry and heal the sick, and he invited everyone to join him. When he comes again... It's to reward those who love him and destroy everyone who stood against him. 
Remember, he's the same today and forevermore. So there's some encouragement in this sermon. First, I know there are people who have experienced injustice. Maybe you were wronged. A crime was committed against you. You were violated. Something was stolen from you. Someone you love was hurt by someone else. And maybe you never got justice. Or maybe the, the justice you got doesn't even come close to measuring up to the pain that you felt. And those are moments you are faced with the depravity of this world and the terrible pain that sin causes. And it leaves you frustrated and longing for justice because we were made in God's image. We, that's why we long for justice because God loves justice. You need to know that there will come a day when all good will be rewarded and all evil will be punished. And every victim will get justice in the end. I want to conclude this message back where we started with Moses. And I was telling you that Moses wasn't a murderer because the Bible makes it clear he was not a murderer. In Acts chapter 7 in the New Testament, Stephen is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about Moses. And here's what he says, kind of recapping the story. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites, He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, and they did not. Why is he talking about this? Because here's Moses. He came to save his brother, the Hebrew slave, who was being beaten to death by an Egyptian, and rather than being received as a deliverer, he was scoffed at and accused of murder. Stephen told this story to the Pharisees and the Jews around him because he was making a point. He was making a point that the same way y'all didn't recognize Moses as a deliverer, you have failed to recognize that Jesus also came as a deliverer. Read the passage. That's the point of the passage. Moses was a deliverer God sent to rescue this Hebrew brother from death and from slavery. And the people didn't recognize him. And Jesus is the deliverer God sent to rescue us from death and from slavery. And and a lot of you have failed to recognize him. That's what Stephen was saying in Acts 7. And, And today, a lot of people still fail to recognize him. And most of you recognize him. Most of you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, but maybe not all of you. Today, we've had people at church all day who are in that boat. They're like, yeah, I, haven't, I haven't really made up my mind yet. Or, or, or I, I think I will someday, but I'm still figuring it out. I'm still kind of getting some things together first. <laughs> well, here's the deal. You've only got as long as you've got. And you don't know how long that is. Nobody knows the day or the hour when Jesus will return. When he returns... It's done. You don't know how long your life is going to last. The Bible says life is like a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. The younger you are, the more time you think you have. But the older you get, the less time you realize you have. You don't know how long your life's going to be. So if you're sitting on the fence with Jesus and you're like, yeah, maybe one of these days, you know, when I, when I get done partying and having fun, then I'll, I'll settle down and, and I'll accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Well, you don't know if you're going to live to someday. And it's appointed to a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. There's no purgatory. There is no second chance. There's no reincarnation. You've got this life, and then you face the consequences of your decision to either accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior or reject him and oppose him. And as you saw, it doesn't work out good for those who do that. So that's why I would plead with you today, if you've been on the fence, maybe hesitant to accept Jesus, choose Jesus. Accept him while you have the opportunity. The way to have peace with God is through faith in Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. If that's you and you're like, yeah, I want want Jesus, then I'm gonna invite you to pray this prayer with me. Wherever you're at, just say, God, I ask you to save me and I believe in Jesus. I trust in Jesus to save me because I know I can't save myself. I believe that Jesus is the son of God I believe he died on the cross for my sins to pay the price that I owed. I believe Jesus rose again and gives me eternal life. And I believe he's coming again and that someday I'll see him face to face. I want to live for Jesus from this day forward. I ask you, Lord, to lead me 
And I thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.